Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello. Uh, it is December 13th. Um, and this week's discussion is on the early development of uh, Jodoshu, and particularly its founder, Honen. And for the purposes of some introduction, uh, I will be following up from my last discussion a month ago about the rise of Kamakura Buddhisms and in fact, also uh, relate back to some of the introduction, other introduction to East Asian Buddhism talks that we've had uh, some months ago now, because in fact, uh, Jodo Shu's history can be drawn back to uh, pre-East Asia, uh, as we found when we were talking about Pure Land Buddhism of, of China. Pure Land concepts had their roots in India. And we're developing alongside uh, alongside other pre Mahayana teachings, concepts we've we've discussed previously, uh, like that of Buddha Nushvirti, uh, a single minded focus on the Buddha, and uh, the Buddha Kshetra, the purified Buddha fields, helped in part to establish the developing Mahayana uh, doctrine into the uh, into the future as it moved into China. These concepts would be the first kind of building blocks for what was to develop into Yoroshu, as we will see. Therefore, with the early establishment of Pure Land teachings, we can assume that they have always had a place within East Asian Buddhist history. So uh, therefore, to give a, a slight recap of those discussions, when we talk about Pure Land uh, Buddhism, we have to make some language distinctions. Again, we've discussed these in the past, but to, to bring it back, uh, Pure Land has come to mean many different things over time. The earliest concepts of it, again, originating in, in, in India, it, it was first an explanation of various Buddha fields, and Buddha lands, uh, a Buddha Kshetra, a pure, unsullied plane of being outside of our perceptions, uh, where each realm is ascribed a particular Buddha according to their cosmological cardinal direction. And uh, thus, there were numerous Buddha lands. Yakshinyorai, the medicine Buddha, uh, our Honzo mountain in the, in the um, temple, for example, has their own Buddha land. However, the term Buddha land also came to refer to one in particular, that of Sukhavati, the Western paradise, a land of pure bliss, the land of Amida Buddha, uh, or Amitabha Buddha, the Buddha of infinite light, or Amitayas, same, same image, same uh, character, the Buddha of infinite light. Then the various traditions of practices and teachings about these purified realms also being termed as Pure Land Buddhism. This concept was also later refined to speak of the, the practices and teachings specifically associated with Amida Buddha. And finally, in reference to our discussion tonight, Pure Land Buddhism in relation to Jodo Shu, and in a later dis discussion, Jodo Shinshu, uh, the developments of, of defined schools of Japanese Pure Land Buddhism. These are important distinctions to make because when we say Pure Land Buddhism, Buddhisms, we may be implying all of these or simply just one. Therefore, for this discussion on Jodo Shu, the Japanese Pure Land School, we must acknowledge that this concept, Jodo Shu, developed out of these earlier meanings, explanations, practices, teachings. In, in my last talk about the developing Kamakura era of Japanese Buddhism, I tried to explain how these new schools of that during that time were coming out of situations of political, social, cultural and religious reforms of that time. Thus, these schools did not appear out of a vacuum, from out of nowhere. Honen and Jodoshu's establishment came out of this long history 
and under certain particular conditions. And it's those aspects that I hope to cover in the following. Because Jodoshu's use and prevalence in Japan's culture and history, and indeed in, in even into its current popularity in Japan today, as one of the largest Buddhist denominations, marks it as a huge influential factor when considering Japanese Buddhisms on the whole. I will add here a slight digression uh, that I will not be taking a huge digression into the arguments that schools like Jodoshu uh, may not necessarily be Buddhist and in fact are considered Amidist. That's a whole other subject and definitely worthy of discussion, but not something I'm going to be covering this evening. Um, if we recall from our previous discussions, the presence of Pure Land teachings was well established in China uh, as one of the two practice uh, schools of Chinese Buddhism, the other being Cha'an uh, meditation schools. And compared uh, these compared to the two doctrinal schools of Tiantai and Huaqian schools. Again, here schools being less, uh, loosely termed, um, they're more like trains of thought, not in school or sex as we might define them today. This continues into Japan, where pure land teachings being found uh, are being found within some of the Nara schools. So again, the teachings and practices were present but were not a distinct movement in and of themselves. This is one aspect that distinguishes Jodoshu from that history, in that Honen initiates the process of it becoming its own distinct formal school, and particularly a Japanese version of those original Pure Land teachings. More than on that in a, in a second. But to my point that Jodoshu didn't come out of a vacuum, Pure Land teachings were part of Tiantai and thus Tendai practice as well. Jiri's Moho Chiguan, or the Makashikan, the Great Calming and Contemplation, it describes the use of Pure Land teachings within its section on constant walking meditation practice. This is the Jogyo Zanmai. Uh, the walking meditation of circumambulating an image of Amida while reciting Amida's mantra. It can be termed as a contemplative nembutsu. The term nembutsu here can be translated as Buddha mindfulness, and thus was a way for a pra the practitioner to contemplate Amida's pure land as a way to access Amida's teachings, benevolence, etc. For Saito's part, his focus on Jui's teaching kept much of those same practices and was and was therefore um, the the Jodushu, uh, I'm sorry, the Pure Land teachings were thus taught and practiced on Mount Hiei from the beginning. But much like the esotericism found in Tendai, it was Saito's predecessors that really defined, refined, and extolled further details of those teachings that brought them prevalence within Tendai. One, uh, one Tendai scholar monk of note here is Genshin, uh, 942 to 1017, and his text in particular, the Ojo Yoshu, completed in 985. This work can be considered one of the first formative Japanese perspective on Pure Land teachings. Again, up till now, much of these teachings were still being imported from China. So Genshin's portrayal of the Pure Land practice becomes a focal point for future Tendai priests and foreshadowing Onen and Shinran. There is a whole conversation to be had about Genshin himself, to say nothing of uh, the Ojo Yoshu as a text in and of itself, but suffice it to say that it became formative for Japanese Pure Land thought. It was an accessible text. It was readable. It was understandable, both to priests, but also to the laity. Remember, the sutras and teachings had generally not been considered very accessible to any, other than 
the monks, monks, nuns, who spent most of their lives trying to understand them. But this text was a much more comprehensible outline <laughs> of pure land practice. It also spoke to an underlying, uh, an underlying socio-religious phenomena that we have talked about here many times, but that becomes vitally important to Honen's argument for establishing the Jodo school. That is the concept of Mapo, the age of the degenerate Dharma. As we distance ourselves in time from the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, it is said that, that humans are unable to fully understand the teachings through meaning. Over time, people would therefore lose trust in our own abilities to actually become awakened. And thus, trust in religious practice wavered as well, since it was perceived that any practice would be futile. Seichel was aware of this development, and, and hence why he argued for ten, Tendai teachings as being important to a young Japanese, uh, young Japan during this era. But for the generations that followed, this fear and mistrust only continued. It was Genshin through this text who argued that this pure land practice was what was the most efficacious to use during an era uh, uh, of Mapo. And obviously it was rather convincing. In the Oju Yoshu, he describes a contemplative Nembutsu, similar to Ju'i's practice uh, the practitioner enters into a meditative state, samadhi, focused on Amida, while reciting the mantra Namu Amida Butsu, homage to Amida Buddha. The practitioner enters Amida's Buddha field, Sukhavati, and experiences that sphere of influence, where they can experience Amida's power, wisdom, and benevolence. In this way, although the, uh, in this way, although the text would become the foundation of the new Pure Land schools, the techniques described within are still deeply rooted in Tiantai and Tendai teachings. Honen, as we will see, writes numerous commentaries just on this one text, but spends most of them arguing that the text is really trying to emphasize the use of a recitative Nembutsu and not a merely a contemplative one. And these commentaries often skew later interpretations and readings of the Ojo Yoshu, seeing the text through a more Honen perspective. However, one cannot deny the Ojo Yoshu's place within the evolution of Pure Land teachings, which appropriately brings us to another step of that evolution, Honen. He became a novitiate at the young age of nine after the death of his father and soon was training and studying on Mount Hiei as a Tendai monk. He is said to have been incredibly bright um, and legend has it that through, throughout his life he read the entire Buddhist canon three times over. Right. Um, however, even as a young man, he grew increasingly dissatisfied with Buddhist teachings. He realized that he was to be perpetually faced with the fact that, that we're all bound to break precepts. We're not always able to follow the path wholeheartedly. And while on Mount Hiei, being constantly faced with the Tendai school's reliance upon the elites, providing in large part uh, a functionary role for the nation, for himself, he had to change things dramatically. In that, he felt that as a priest on the Bodhisattva path, working for the benefit of others so that all may attain awakening, the teachings as they were presented did not allow a huge section of society to have access to the teachings. And thus, Many were left out of without were left without a way to become awakened. As we've discussed previously, the end of the Heian era and the rise of the Kamakura was a turbulent time in Japan. There was a tremendous amount of change going on in all aspects of Japanese life, and religiously was no exception. 
and Honan, being raised during this exact time of the dynasty shift, was keenly aware of these changes and the need for Buddhist teaching to reach the masses to better guide all sentient beings towards awakening. Buddhism had been, up to that point, mostly, if not completely, unrelatable to the general Japanese population. But the revolution going on started to change that. There was a groundswell of itinerant monks outside of the governmental religious structure preaching in public spheres the Buddhist teachings. And with increased social mobility, more and more of the gender populace was being moved to learn more about Buddhism. And, and to hone in, this is what was needed, a simple, accessible way to hear and follow Buddhist teachings. And this was, uh, this was his great aim, to find a Buddhism that anyone could follow. The age of Mapo emphasized to him the importance of no longer relying upon self-practice alone, jiriki, awakening based on one's own power, like meditation, and instead looked to a tariki approach, or other power, relying upon an outside influence for aid. Through the larger Pure Land Sutra and writings of Chinese Pure Land scholars and Genshin's Ojo Yoshu, he became inspired by the soteriological teachings of faith in Amida Buddha. In Amida's Pure Vows, it is stated that anyone calling out the name of Amida Buddha would be reborn in their pure land. Hence, the Nembutsu. Now, Niyamf, the Niyamfu in, in Chinese was already well established as a practice. However, as I mentioned before, Honen moved away from the practice of a contemplative Nembutsu and instead argued for merely needing to recite the words Namu Amida Butsu. With humans' infinite capacity for delusion, the age of Mapo further sullying the Buddhist teachings, all that could be done was to have faith in Amida and practice the recitative, the recitative Nembutsu. But this was a huge change. It allowed any Jokshmo to practice and experience a way into the Buddhist teachings. And although Honen was encouraging a way towards awakening, much of the influence to the masses was the idea of being reborn into an amazing place after death. We should remember that at its core, life and death are of supreme importance. The cycle of rebirth, samsara, is an existential threat. In fact, most, if not all, major and world religions provi provide their answers to this very issue of how to deal with death. And so the idea of a pure realm of bliss and happiness would obviously be very enticing. And all I have to do is write and recite Namu Amida Butsu? Sign me up. And so it really grabbed a lot of attention. It was incredibly empowering, and especially to the lower classes. And accordingly, a lot of the aristocracy and the Buddhist institutions did not like being undermined that way. And like many revolutionaries over history, he was not very appreciative um, uh, for in his own time. By 1204, Pure Land teachings were actually banned and the followers persecuted. Pure Land priests were kicked out of Kamakura, the, the capital of the shogunate. And Honen and some of his disciples were exiled. But this only encouraged an anti-establishment identity which only further ingratiated the teachings with the masses. Honen's influence thus started a snowball of a huge movement in this type of practice. Finran, one of his disciples, continued with the, the trend and later found Jodo Shinshu, the true Pure Land school. 
and more on him next month, where I, I really want to contrast these two uh, and compare these two. But to summarize, the biggest difference was that Honen uh, suggested both the practice of the Nembutsu and faith in Amitabha, or uh, Amida Buddha. But after his death, his disciples would argue amongst themselves about which was more important, practice or faith. Chinran went the way of faith. Again, we'll talk about that next month. Whether it's the concept of Mapo or the popularization of laity-centric practice, Jodoshu practice can be incredibly insightful for us today. This idea of a recitative nembutsu can help us, even as followers of Tendai, to open up a world of possibilities. Yes, pun intended. The, the use of Amida's mantra in our moment-to-moment -moment lives can be incredibly influential. Now, I have to say that the following is my own, <clears throat> my own editorial on the subject, so take it as you will, but I urge you to try it. For me, at least, it, it's a way to help inform a contemplative Nembutsu relying on Zhou Yi's and Genshin's teachings. Again, Honen was providing a way to help all access the benevolence of Amida to provide perspective and solace. So use it as such. The mantra is a way to enter into a greater understanding of what Amida's pure land represents. We can tap into what it means to be in this realm of existence, but to also start to bend our perspective and our perception of what else there could be. To truly bring the mundane world and the absolute world into a single moment, into every moment. We have to experience what it feels like for ourselves. What comes out, uh, what comes out of it is up to, up to your experience. But for me, it's one way to help recall my purpose. I may use it whenever I see a dead animal on the side of the road, for example. I pray for that animal. We have a, a small prayer that we say during our walking practice, during Yo, our, our priesthood training um, periods. And it goes, your corpse, small friend, is a bell of mindfulness, returning me to my breath. Vow, and I'm renewing my vow to save all sentient beings. I use the Nimbutsu in that way, as a bell of mindfulness. It allows me to contemplate our realm of life and death, of this samsara. With that utterance, I start to, hopefully, shift, change. With the hopes that I will come to each following moment with a bit more pure landedness. My children are certainly very trying at times. <laughs> I have to stop, breathe, recite, and presumably am less likely to respond with anger, and instead, hopefully, with a bit more equanimity. It takes my blinders off. I can broaden my perspective try to interact with the moment with less of a sullied perspective. Does it always work? No! Does it help? Sure! Why wouldn't you want a little bit more of something like that in your life? We talk about bringing the meditation off the cushion to be imbued with a certain perspective, to not be sullied, by the three poisons of desire, and <laughs> anger, and hatred, and, and delusion. To not be encumbered by Mara. To not be distracted by discursive thoughts. And yet, life happens. We have dukkha, discontentedness, pain, 
suffering. That's what, to me, Honan might have been trying to convey. If we can rely on a simple tool, not simplistic, but hone that tool into a precise instrument, we can cut through our delusion, our anger, our dukkha. Now, I may argue that as being Tendite, we should have more than one tool in our toolbox. And we can always work to develop and hone others. And in fact, as we do so, all those tools mutually accentuate the other. But we cannot dismiss the ease and single-mindedness of a recitative nembutsu practice, as Honen extolled. It's accessible. The constant reciting is a constant reminder to remain focused, concentrated on what is most important, how to be in this world, namely how to be with Amida Buddha in their pure land and bringing that into our moment to moment daily life stuff. We can reframe our outlook our mindset, to be more and more in line, more and more engaged with the Buddha Dharma. My use of it is a personal one, and it doesn't always rely on the thought of being reborn in Sukhavati after this life, for example. I'm being reborn in every moment. That's why we do Sangimon in the, the general repentance in our daily service. It's a type of rebirth. It does help me to bring back to mind the Buddhist teachings, even this place, this Sangha. A reminder to live with purpose and intention and not simply go blindly through habitual dukkha-ridden responses to what life throws at us. That's just me. Honen obviously had his own perspective. But we cannot dismiss the practice outright without first trying it for ourselves. This is the core, a core teaching that Shakyamuni Buddha always brought up. Just a guy who found a way, a way to relieve dukkha. But we have to walk that way ourselves to practice it to, and to make sense of it for ourselves so that we can experience and therefore have faith in that way. Namo Amidabas. Thank you so much. Um, before I get into questions and comments, um, I would ask if Ichishima Sensei and Monty oh. Sensei, do you have Sen any comments? Please. Okay, thank you. Uh... Our uh, uh, temple, Senzoji, we had the uh, uh, transmission of the Eshin Souls Genshin's secret name. Uh, one of the understanding of Amida, he says that the A is for emptiness, me is for temporal truth, and Da is middle truth. Uh, such a way he can uh, understand and uh, such a five uh, secret the transmissions of Nembutsu uh, we had uh, at the t uh, uh, up until my grandfather's time. Uh, so it is also very interesting to understand one of the Nembutsu uh, sources in Japan. Of course, Honen is a pioneering uh, person who really spread uh, on Namo Amidabutsu and uh, Shin, Shinran also followed him, and Ippen, of course, he did practical nembutsu, reciting <clears throat> all of uh, Namu Amidabutsu everywhere in the Japan. That is a uh, history of uh, <clears throat> nembutsu odori, or bon odori, uh, in the summertime, uh, Jap people uh, celebrate welcoming ancestors to this country. Uh, present time uh, in terms of uh, dancing nembutsu. So these are very interesting to understand uh, those 
uh, trains in Japan. That is my just comment uh, so far. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was I was going to make um, just a really brief, brief comment. Um, <clears throat> the Ojo Joshu, as you mentioned with with Genshin, was really that's what Honen used to establish his his teaching. And before Honen, several a hundred years before Honen, um, Genshin was using it as what they called the deathbed nembutsu. And there were actually, um, they called them death, deathbed nembutsu societies. These were groups of people, excuse me, who would get together to go to the person who was dying and recite nembutsu over the dying person. This was how many centuries before um, hospice that they were providing assistance and aid to the dying and they were also reciting Nembutsu at that time. And that's one of the ways that the practice of Nembutsu really spread more rapidly uh, before Honen, because the individuals were, were members of these societies who would go to the deathbed of an individual. And the individual is, of course, encouraged to recite Nembutsu <coughs> on his own, uh, his, uh, himself. And so, you can see how powerful that became from the time of Genshin, and then, of course, Honen, um, for all the reasons that you mentioned, marshaled that, and it became what is today the largest school of Buddhism in Japan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, yeah, and I will, I'll just mention on the on the previous slide, uh, there's the picture of Kuya, which I just really right. love. Um, and he would have been one of those itinerant monks um, who would be um, out into the general public again, outside of the uh, governmental structure, um, and and his main practice was nimbutsu. So you see the the amidas coming out of his mouth, um, and it just it's always strikes me as such a such a wonderful. But um, but to your point, it's still, the the practice was being done. Uh, it, it seems to me it, I didn't want to get into all of the my major details, but. Honen really rode a wave that was already building, um, and and therefore the nimbutsu the nimbutsu practice was already uh, of popular. He 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 really just coined it and took it and ran with it, uh, and then his disciples kind of went and uh, made him a de facto founder for what would become Jodo Shu as a as a school. And to uh, to Ichishima Sensei's point, he had mentioned Ipen. There's a, there's a great story of Ipen. Um, who who was much more on the practice side of the faith versus uh, the faith versus practice aspect of the Nimbutsu practice, uh, where he, all his point was just recite, just just recite it nonstop. And that's all you got to do. And so he he spent his life writing had major texts of like to, that this was so important. And as he got later in his life. He looked at all of his writings and saw how futile there was. It was because it just you just had to do nimbutsu. Mm -hmm. He burned all his texts. Mm -hmm. um, but because it is, it, 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 he felt it was just that simple. I mean, again, not simplistic, but but simple. So anyway, I will I will pause the stop the recording here and we'll open it up for.